Keep the change. Think big. Think positive. Never show any sign of weakness. Always go for the throat. Buy low, sell high. Fear, that's the other guy's problem. Nothing you have ever experienced can prepare you for the unbridled carnage you're about to witness. The right. Super Bowl, the World Series, they don't know what pressure is. In this building, it's either kill or be killed. Right. You make no friends in the pits and you take no prisoners. Good idea, it's the execution that is. Well, you know what they say. Bulls make money, bears make money, and the pigs, they get slaughtered. Okay, so we are back into our presentation. Here is, um, I think, where we left off was I was just giving some uh, some just kind of news headlines, um, kind of where we were at the firm. I was talking about Kevin's book. Um, again, it's available on Amazon. And uh, the other, I think, right when I cut out, I was talking about how um, TAM Portfolios is now on the Placemark uh, UMA platform. So uh, we are finally on that. That's a good first step for us to get up on there. So moving right along. I know you guys have a busy afternoon, so again, I apologize about taking up the, the time there. Um, I'm going to really bulletize this and kind of streamline the presentation again, given the time. Um, I'm going to cover the market outlook. I'm going to talk about Sam Stavall. Um, he is a market technician. He's, he's the chief equity strategist at uh, S&P Capital. And Kevin Tuttle, our CS here, um, had the pleasure of meeting Sam at a conference uh, last week in Dallas. And Sam has some very interesting market insight and some things that he's found going back um, over history. Um, of market signs of where we are today, and some of the rules that he has come to come to follow, and um, it, it's kind of some warning signs of things to come that kind of jive with what we're seeing from a market stance. So I'm going to just briefly talk about that, and then just get into portfolio overview, and then we'll we'll wrap it up with with questions. Again, I know there's only a few of you left, but uh, I do thank you for sticking around. Um, so Sam wrote this book called Seven Rules of Wall Street. It's been around now for about five years. Um, again, he's a, a renowned market um, strategist. And it basically what he does is in this book, he talks about seven famous adages that, that investors and institutions have, have heard in passing at some point. And uh, they go back all the way up to World War II. And you, you may be familiar with some of them, uh, such as, uh, as goes January, goes the year. So the, the idea being if January is a positive month, um, investors are optimistic, and the rest of the year is and positive. Uh, and vice versa, if January is a negative month, investors aren't so optimistic, and, and the year doesn't end out quite so well. And the other one that we've all heard of is sell a man go away, right? So the idea being that profit is taken prior to summer and it's made in the in the off the the fall, winter, spring months, and then in the in the summer, institutions, investors, they they step away from the desk, they go on vacation, what have you, and uh, volatility increases. The market is for the most part directionless, and um, you know anybody left in the wake is is, is dealt with this this summer time period. So the question that he poses is this. You know, how often does this happen? Is this just a rumor or a, a myth, or is there actually? Can you back this up with statistics? So I wanted to share a few of those with you because I think they're interesting, and um, they kind of jive with again, like both what we're seeing from our firm. And just in case you're interested, you can get a Sam Stovall bobblehead, which uh, Kevin has on his desk right now. He he brought back with him, and I thought they did a really good job of uh, really, you know, encompassing Sam there. So. So let's talk about the first one, the January barometer. So the idea, again, being that if January is up, the rest of the year is going to be a positive, positive year. And you, you can look at this chart. You can see that uh, of all the years going back to World War II, the market returned 11.5% for the rest of the 11 months versus all the way to the right. You can see that when the S&P was down in January, on average, you returned 0.1%. So that's it's pretty interesting, actually. The stats kind of lean, you know, leaning towards that. Um, another page to kind of back that up, showing you how you know how often does this signal occur and how accurate is it. You can see that the 11 and a half percent increase if January is an up month, you get about 44 more years out of the out of out of the 69 going back to World War II, and it's correct by 84 percent of the time. So it's a it's a pretty high high signal versus when it's down, it's it's accurate about 44 percent of the time. So you know it's not as high, but you know stepping away from granularity here, you know it's just one thing that ma makes you think twice. 
when, when it comes to allocating given, given the market conditions. So that's one thing I want to point out. The second thing is the sell and may go away theory. Here's some stats that he's found to back that up. November through April, you can see in that time frame, historically, the market, the S&P has returned 6.9% versus May through October, you're looking at 1.3%. So again, this is his, his facts are shedding some light on, on a couple of these adages that we, we have come to, come to hear. You know, so now these next few slides I wanted to show you because they kind of, they, they mean a lot for where we are right now. 2014 is a midterm election year. So, you know, we've had the first two years have been very positive. But then historically, if you look back, going back all the way to World War II, again, every year has been down this year. So the question is, are we due for another uh, down year? Um, the median down year is 19% if you look at that line all the way across the screen there. So the question is, are we due for another, if, if the stars align and these stats prove to hold, the trend holds, are we due for another down year? So that's one thing to, to look at. The other thing, breaking us down on a quarterly basis, you can see here's year two of the four-year uh, presidential cycle, so the midterm year. This is the only year that has two back-to-back, -back, well, for that matter, two negative quarters. So that's, that's kind of interesting when you look at it that way. It makes you think twice. Um, and the last chart I want to show you based on Sam's findings here, are the amount of time, the number of months that we have gone without experiencing a ten percent decline of, of any fashion, and you can see over here to the right. Here's here's as of the end of January, we're we're pushing twenty eight months, which is close to uh, you know we're getting up into these outlier areas. You can see in nineteen ninety when we had the beginning of the near the beginning of the secular bull market, it was eighty four months. So that one kind of makes sense. But here you can see, but even factoring that out, you can see these outliers are are in the thirty to fifty area, and we're pushing thirty. So Again, it's another thing to, to add to all your weights of evidence when you decide um, how you're going to allocate from here. So let's sum up his warning signs real quick. So we talked about the four-year cycle low. And um, you know, are we due, it, it, according to the timeline, if the trend continues, it's possible. Quarterly weakness, it's the only year that it has back-to-back -back quor uh, decline quarters. The January barometer. We were down about 3.5% in January on the S&P. So does that mean we're going to end the year? Is, is it going to be a good year, or is it, is it just going to be a 0.1% year? I mean, only time will tell. But again, the stats are backing that up. And again, the, the length of time that it's been since we've had a, a, a major decline greater than 10%, that, that going back to the 2011 um, correction when, when the whole pig's grease debacle was happening, you can see we're pushing 28 months now. It's not to say that this could easily get up to, according to his numbers, up to 55, according to the history, before we do see that decline. So it's not saying that this is going to, this is pending, but it's just something to uh, be aware of. Okay. So now I'm moving on to the. Uh, so just to kind of sum it up, Sam, uh, you know, is a market technician like we are, and uh, you know, he looks at the world with with numbers and facts, and that's why I wanted to just point out his findings because you know it's nice to have other technicians in the space that you you see where their data comes from you understand it and it, um, not only you agree with it but you can see it supports the findings that that you're you're seeing as well so with that I'm going to kind of segue into our our firm overview and our stance and um, we've, we've mentioned this many times fusion analysis and, and fusion analysis just to put it um, frankly, is, is the culmination of fundamental technical and behavioral analysis, so the fundamentals of the market. So how, how healthy is the economy? What do corporate balance sheets look like? Are companies increasing revenue to increase earnings? Um, what's the geopolitical landscape like? So those questions you, you look at. Technical is the support and resistance levels of the market. So where where is the buying pressure? Where is the selling? Is the market overextended? Um, so that's the technical aspect. And the behavioral is the psychological um, factor. So you know, you see this at the tops and bottoms of, of bull markets and bear markets. So you see the greed take over, the euphoria, the get me in, I, I don't want to miss out, versus the I'm never going to buy a stock again at the bottom. And that's the, that's the behavioral aspect. So you, you, those culminate into what we call fusion analysis. And that's how we look at the world and how we, we dictate our firm stance. So I'm going to recap some of the things that we've been talking about um, from the fundamental standpoint. We talked a lot about consumer sentiment. And the reason why this is important is because consumer sentiment drives retail sales, which drives GDP. And GDP um, is, is the underline of, of the health of the economy. It, it is, it, if GDP is increasing, quite frankly, our economy is we're, we're chugging right along. But what you're seeing is you're seeing that divergence between the market prices, as you see back here, the all-time highs in um, 2014 versus this declining level. So the question is, 
you know, what's, what's going to keep us up here? And if retail sales continues to decline, coupled with the fact, and we've talked again about this before, but the fact that the Fed is going to continue to taper their asset purchases, you know, what is the catalyst that is going to keep us going forward? And again, this isn't going to happen overnight, but the thing is, it's just the warning signs are mounting. And from the behavioral aspect, you know, one of the things that, one of the indicators we look at from behavior is the intelligence investor sentiment indicator. And it basically measures, it, it's, a, it's an indicator that measures the bullishness and bearishness of investors. And right now we're seeing the highest level on that indicator since 1987. And if you want to see that chart, we had it in our last webinar from last month. If you want to go and reference that, you can go to our website and, and check it out. But for the sake of um, brevity, I, I didn't put it in here. But th so that, that begs the question, given that, that data and some other indicators that support that. Are we at that euphoric point, this top of this, this cyclical cycle where everything's fine and dandy and, and nothing's wrong and, and investors become complacent and they forget to manage risk or they don't even care about managing risk? And when that happens, you need to be extra cautious because, I mean, again, it's, are we on the precipice of the downturn? It's hard to tell in the day-to-day, -day, but you, know, you have to add these things up to, to kind of look down the chessboard. And then you can see at the bottom here, like I was saying, you know, they get complacent and then the market, you have a sell-off and then at the desperation, at the, at the end of everything, they throw in the towel, get me out, I don't want to buy a stock again, the market goes back up and you have the cycle starts over again. So that's the psychological aspect. And then I'm going to tie it up with the technicals that we're seeing. Um, you've seen that, that rise to all-time highs at the end of December, the end of 2013. And since then, you've seen a correction. You've seen that, that mini pullback um, on on higher in increasing volume followed by a, a, a bounce on decreasing volume. And the, the reason why that's important, and again, I want to highlight this area because, you know, it's the, it's the velocity of the, of the selling. It's, it's the amount of volume going in behind the selling or the buying that, that really it gives you the confidence because volume tells you the directional confidence of an investor. So if an investor, if investors are confident in one direction, you're, you should see in, in that statistics back this up, you will see follow through movement based on the direction of that volume. So right here, what we're seeing right now in the interim is we're seeing higher volume at the sell side than you are at the buy side. Now, this could easily pattern out over the next three months, and then the, the coin could flip, and it could be the opposite. But right now, in the interim, looking, looking at this right now, it, it's, a, it's a sign of precaution. You need to raise the caution flag. And just to kind of back that up with some numbers, the, the actual volume of the sell, the selling is 30% greater than it typically is versus the buying volume on this retest, on this bounce, was 10% less than average. So that really just goes to show you that people are more biased to the sell side than they are to the buy side, regardless of the actual amount of distance the price made back. And one last point, too, I want to throw out there is the standard deviation is reaching um, a nine-month high. So that's significant because when you look at typical tops and bottoms of markets, not always, but uh, a lot of the time you will see standard deviation, your volatility, your price swings will increase near the tops. As the, as the tug of war between bulls and bears wages on, you see this increase in volatility. So that's another thing to, to point out. Okay, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and segue into uh, our portfolios. And just kind of give you a brief overview of, of first of all, how, how they're meant to be used. And, and I won't dive too far into this. If you have any more questions about how you could use our portfolio strategies and if you're an advisor and, and one of your clients' um, allocation strategies, um, you, you can get a hold of our national sales director. And uh, I can get you that information at the end of the webinar. But for now, I'm just going to kind of keep it brief and tell you that they can be used as core holdings. So you can allocate a client's account towards one of these portfolios as a core. And uh, so that's one way. The other way is a, as a sleep approach. So um, if you wanted to put a, just a portion of a client's account into one of these portfolios, you can. So they're designed to be very, very flexible in that respect. And, and I'll dive into a little bit why, how that works as I go through each one. Um, but the first portfolio I'm going to bring up is Sage. And Sage is our all-cap core uh, sector rotation strategy focused on, um, on basically reducing volatility while uh, maintaining growth while protecting capital. So the idea is rotate in and out of sectors that are coming in, in and out of favor with the market, capture that growth, but then when things um, become volatile and market direction becomes um, murky at best, reduce exposure and wait until clarity arises uh, until volatility diminishes to, to bring exposure back to a full level or, or an acceptable level. So I want to highlight kind of how we achieved that based on the, the results of the portfolio. We've been open for a little over a year. 
13 months. So you can see that the, our worst month has been 2.5% versus 3.5% in the S&P. Average loss is 1.2 versus 2.5% on the S&P. And our max drawdown is 4 versus 6. Now these things all kind of couple together to show you that you know, in, in these phases of the market, and I'll show you in the next chart, volatility was increasing. So we decided to reduce the um, exposure, minimize that drawdown, but also get, get out of the uncertainty of not knowing where the direction was going to head. So you can see that in, the, in, in these drawdown numbers, the worst month, the average loss, that drawdown is really minimized based on that concept. And that being said, I will, I will let you know that we have reduced our portfolios given the aforementioned chart I was telling you about the increase in standard deviation in the S&P to a nine-month high. We have <clears throat> reduced our exposure, let's call it 40%, um, due to that. And again, as, until clarity arises, we are going to maintain that, that stance. But if things strengthen and our metrics that we look at uh, strengthen and, and increase, we, it's very possible we could uh, put exposure back on and, and, and be full pad again. But right now, we are just protecting capital and, and, and waiting for more clarity in the interim. OK, this is a growth of uh, 100,000 since inception, a pretty typical chart. But I just want to show you how you know, we, in these periods where the market, you can see volatility is increasing these areas, and it had a drawdown, and increase in this area had a drawdown. These are areas where we reduced exposure to, again, to minimize that drawdown. And it caused a little bit underperformance just in that small time frame. But these portfolios are meant to operate on longer term three to five time horizons. So you know, a 1% here, 2% there in the interim, you know, when, you fact, when you look at it from getting out of the way of an 08 or, uh, or 2000, when we protected capital, and you can look at our track records for um, other portfolios, you know we really uh, mitigate that risk, and so the, the the beauty of this portfolio is realized in a longer term time horizon. So I just wanted to point that out. The next chart's a drawdown. It just again another way to look at it. In May, when the taper announcement was was uh, first came about, we reduced exposure. Again, things were getting volatile. Direction was unclear, and we minimized the drawdown to about three percent versus the six for the S and P. And we did it again in July when when it got volatile. So you can see it, it really showing in those those two charts there. Here's on a, on a standard deviation basis. Um, I know it's getting a little charty here, but we were five point two percent versus the S and P is seven point nine percent. So that's about two thirds of the volatility of the S and P. So again, on a standard deviation basis, we're we're two thirds. Um, this chart. Um, so since we're new in the year, our year to date and our month are, are going to be the same. We're only one month in. But on a three-month rolling, um, we have a little bit of an outperformance of the S&P, about 1%. OK, our next portfolio is Pulse. This is our alternative long-short-based portfolio. And it, its whole objective is to capitalize on uh, cyclical and um, secular bullish and bearish phases. So when the market is in a growth phase, we want to be able to capture that and deliver that to investors. So we want to capture without getting shaken out in, in, for the most part, noise when you're looking at a, a longer term time frame. So we, the, the, the goal is to capture the 09s to now, the two, 2003s to 2008s on the long side, and flip the coin, actually gain ground and, and, and make money on the downside from the, the 08s to the, to the 2009s when the market is, is in a, a sell-off phase. So you know this is this is a great benefit to an advisor who's looking to um, you know inherently reduce exposure in, in another 2008 scenario when uh, the market is showing signs of weakness and, and actually starts to correct. You can have a pulse in your in, um, in your allocation and actually reduce exposure just because it, it goes short the market. And again, it does this based on inverse ETFs. So um, just highlight again some more facts about how this portfolio operates. This this is a model based portfolio. It goes back to 2000, and you can see the you know the the, the way that it operates really shines in, in the since inception annualized basis number on return. You can see a 16 percent annualized return versus a three and a half on the S and P. So it really outshines. You can it really outperforms there. Um, on a max drawdown basis, again, it is a longer term indicator, so it's not going to be, um, you know, it's not speed of Gonzales, it's not, it's not trading every other day. So it, it will experience some drawdown here um, in the interim as it segues over to those those shifts, so those, those secular cyclical shifts. But when it does, it captures a bulk of the move. So you can see the max drawdown was 29 versus the 55 percent drawdown of the S&P, and the 2008, it actually ended positive. So when it finally did shift, it actually gained ground. And then you ended the year positive versus the S&P was down 37. Um, one thing I want to point out is, is you can see in, in a risk 
and the Greeks, by the way, this, this second column over here, the, what we call the Greeks, if you're not familiar, they're a way to measure the risk of your portfolio. And alpha is a way um, just to think about it. If, if the market were flat, if your benchmark, the S&P 500, is flat for the year, you could expect to make 3.7% in this portfolio. So that's a way to look at it. So it's your outperformance above your benchmark. And so this is giving you that high alpha uh, performance with a very low correlation. R squared is how correlated to you are, the pro to, are you to the price movement of the market. In this case, you're less than half. So you're getting this outperformance with half the correlation. I, I mean, it, it, it really, really speaks for itself. And this portfolio has not made any allocation shifts in, in the recent months. It still remains um, fully invested. Although our firm stance, like I said, is, is um, bull neutral, cautiously optimistic, um, being a longer term uh, directional portfolio, it has not, we have not given an indication to switch yet. So we are still fully long in pulse. And this chart, I know it looks kind of ridiculous, but this is our, our model chart going back to 2000. You can see just the astronomical outperformance of, of pulse over, um, over a 14 year period of time, again, since the model was enacted. Um, here is a, a look at drawdown for a longer term time frame. So you can see in 2000, you know, when the tech boom happened, as soon as it switched over, the, the drawdown was maximized at 30% versus the 50, I'm sorry, the 48% for the S&P. And the same thing happened again in 08. You had your drawdown was capped at right about 18% and then it made it back as the market continued to fall. So you really see that beauty in, in, the, in the drawdowns in a, in a longer term frame. Um, I'm going to focus on this chart down here. This is just the month to date. Again, the month is similar to, to the year to date. Um, so we're, we're slightly outperforming the S&P for the year, but again, we're only one month in. So, uh, But here's your outperformance a longer term time frame on a five-year basis. Um, you can see that it's, it's comparable a little bit less, but on a seven and 10-year basis, you're talking 16 versus five on the S&P and, and 16 versus four on the S&P for a 10-year basis. So you really see it outshine in, the, in those, those longer term time periods. Um, last but not least, big is our income and growth strategy. Um, it's different from other income strategies you may have seen. Uh, a lot of these strategies will, in times of when they want to reduce exposure, they'll just go to cash, um, liquidate positions and go to cash. However, we uh, take a little bit different approach and, and Instead of going to cash, we will actually hedge the portfolio with a, um, an inverse market ETF because the idea is that you have a growth ETF that's taking a growth position that's taking advantage of these uh, cyclical moves. In this case, right now, we have an allocation towards the preferred, the preferred ETF. It's called the PFF. So as soon as the market starts to, it starts to correct and we see that shift from the cyclical upturn to the cyclical downturn, one of the possibilities is the, the PFF is eliminated and replaced with um, an inverse market ETF to really bring your exposure down from full to maybe a 50 or even a 25. So the idea is you're protecting capital on the way down, but you're still receiving income. Since inception, you can see there's an outperformance. The benchmark in, for big in this case is we're, we're using the Barclays Aggregate Bond Index. So you can see an 8%, almost a little less than double what the uh, underlying index is at, at uh, close to 5. 2008 return, you're looking at, um, you know, again, because there was some correlation to the market in this time frame, you, you experienced a little bit of a drawdown versus the Barclays, but as soon as it hedged, that's, that's you know, that's, that's the drawdown that you took. That's it, no, no more. And the S&P, again, was down 54%. Um, and last, I want to talk about current yield. So this portfolio, the next chart will show this, but right now we're sitting at a 6%. So you're, you're seeing that outperformance in yield, the 6 versus the 2.3. So, you know, you got to give, you, know, you got to kind of put some weight on that. And, and to get that yield, you have to experience a little bit more of that volatility, but you do get that growth and you get that outperformance of the yield over the, um, over the index. And I also want to point out, again, going over to the Greeks and the risk area here, you have a very high alpha generation. Um, you're talking about a 9% over the, over the uh, benchmark. So that's, that's absolutely phenomenal. And again, this portfolio, similar to Pulse in the, in the time frame, it's longer term. So we remain fully invested. But again, pending a longer term uh, market um, deterioration, we could see hedging this one too. It's just we haven't had that signal yet. Um, again, similar chart to what I've shown you before. Here's your growth of inception since the model. Um, if I haven't said it already, this is another model-based portfolio. 
Going back to 2007, so you can see here in the beginning uh, that capital was protected here. Uh, portfolio was hedged while the market, this is the S&P, the orange line, continued to fall down. And as soon as the market entered a growth phase, we recapitalized and, and put exposure back on, and, and boom, there you go. So that just shows you the hedging capability. Again, from the drawdown analysis, you only experienced a, um, you know, less than way less than the S&P of 50, 54 percent in 2008 in this area here. And again, in 11, um, it took way less drawdown. Um, this chart down here, these are the, uh, sorry, going back to the annualized returns. Um, again, it outperforms in the longer term three, five, you know, 10-year time frames. You can see the 6.8 versus the 3.7, the 9.6 versus the 5, and the 8 versus the 5. So you can really see it outperform there. And the last thing I want to highlight is the um, uh, big yield. This is, this is a, a, a rolling yield on a, a daily time frame of big. So it vacillates anywhere between 5 to 5.5 uh, five to 8 percent, um, going back to when the model was started. So Currently, we're sitting at 6%, which is um, a really good yield. And given the condition of the income markets, I know we've talked about this before, uh, but you've seen a, a pretty good sell-off in the income markets back when the taper scare in May. Um, if you're not familiar, you can refer to our older research. Uh, you saw that taper sell-off, and you saw kind of the baby get thrown out with the bathwater in the income markets. And, and it brought into question, is, is the space still a good place to be? Is income still a place to be? And, and our, our answer was yes. There was nothing fundamentally wrong. It was just a knee-jerk reaction. And so because of that, you're starting to see now in, in the past three, four months, you've started to see investors really come back into the space and accumulate uh, income-producing um, investments. And so what I want to just stress to you is that this, it, it's a great opportunity for an income vehicle such as VIG, given the yield, and the risk versus the reward of, of the return to um, of uh, the return growth in this space. So that's it for the portfolios. It's going to wrap it up here. Um, again, just what I talked about in the beginning. I know I was trying to make it brief. Uh, you know, our stance: we're still utilizing caution as warning signs continue to appear. Um, and again, we're we're getting these affirmations from other professionals in the space that that we uh, that are backed up with, with statistics and data. Um, exposure, we've already redone, begun to reduce it in stage to minimize the volatility as, as the market um, gets a little bit whippy up here um, as we protect capital, as we wait for clarity. Again, if clarity were to arise and we were to have a really strong confirmation on all the metrics we look at, that the market is, again, going to re-enter another uh, great opportunity and risk-reward phase, then we would reallocate. But right now, we just don't have that. It's too soon to tell. And then, like I was just saying about big, um, it's a great opportunity in big. There's an opportunity with the yield, with the risk reward standpoint, but it's not going to. It's a narrowing window as as investors swoop up these yields and these um, these great value plays. That that's going to start to diminish. So it's it's um, it's an opportunity where timing is definitely involved. So I think uh, if, if nobody else has any more questions, I think I'm going to end up there at 3 o'clock. I know we kind of went late with that little snafu we have with, with, the, uh, with the glitch on the microphone, so I do apologize about that. But I do want to thank everybody who joined us today and uh, join us next month. And